Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Tina Turner. I am a comprehensive ophthalmologist in Gross Point with the Henry Ford Health System. I did my residency at U of M, go blue. Today we're gonna to talk about viscoelastics. Most of what I'm gonna tell you is from this excellent textbook. There's a newer edition of the textbook, which is also wonderful. My other reference is gonna be this brain. This textbook is an excellent reference. This brain is a work in progress and prone to malfunction, so bear with me. Let's first start talking about the function of viscoelastic devices in cataract surgery. We basically use them to maintain the intraocular space so that you've got room to move when inside the eye. How did we do that in the past? Does anybody know? We basically used air, which was less than ideal. Um, we also use OVDs to protect the endothelium. Why is that important? Um, because we're born with about 3,500 endothelial cells per square millimeter, and we have a, around 2,400 of those by the time we're an adult, and we continue to lose them throughout the rest of our life, and they don't repopulate. So the more protection, the better. We also need to talk a little bit about rheologic properties in order to understand the function of OVDs and how they do their job. The first word we need to understand in rheology is viscoelasticity, and that's a substance's ability to return to its original state after being stressed. Just like these balls, when they're compressed, they return to their original round state. We also need to understand viscosity. Viscosity is a substance resistance to flow. Let's take a look at one of my all-time favorite substances, ketchup. Can you believe that ketchup is more viscous than honey? Which partially explains this phenomenon, but only partially. Ketchup is ultra resistant to flow. However, it is also highly pseudoplastic. And pseudoplasticity refers to a substance's ability to transform under pressure. So something that's thick at rest and thinner at higher shear rates. So if you take that bottled ketchup and put it in a squirt bottle and place it under a super high shear rate, it behaves like a low viscosity substance and comes out a whole lot easier. Don't you just love science, getting your ketchup out of the bottle quicker? One of the other very lovable attributes of ketchup is its surface tension or coatability. Surface tension is determined by a substance's contact angle, and that angle is determined by how a substance sits on a surface. A substance with low surface tension has a low contact angle, has a better ability to spread, and a better ability to coat, just like ketchup. Unlike water, which has a high surface tension and beads up and has a high contact angle on a surface. But ketchup, super, super coatable. Excellent on your burger. Now that we understand some of these fancy rheologic terms, let's talk about the physical characteristics of some of the compounds which determine their properties. One of the characteristics that determine a viscoelastic's property is its chain length. So these are polymers that usually have pretty long chain lengths. And if you increase the chain length, will obviously increase the interactions that the molecule has within itself. And so that can increase viscosity and elasticity by increasing interchain reactions. And if you increase a substance's concentration of all these molecules, you'll increase interchain molecular interactions, and that also increases viscosity and increases elasticity and decreases pseudoplasticity. Enough rheology, let's talk actually about some clinical useful descriptors with respect to viscoelastics. So a viscocohesive substance is a highly viscous substance, basically through intermolecular interactions, entanglement, and intramolecular bonds. A viscodispersive substance has a low molecular weight, so it would have lower intra and interchain reactions and a lower surface tension and low pseudoplasticity. A viscoadaptive viscoelastic is going to have both of those properties. Um, and at low flow or low shear rates, it's going to behave as a viscous, cohesive OVD. But at high um, shear rates, you're going to get fracturing of um, the molecules into smaller pieces, and it will mimic the properties of a dispersive viscoelastic. So it will do both. So take a look at the picture to your right. Which of those is a cohesive viscoelastic and which is a dispersive viscoelastic? Yes, this one is a cohesive and this one is dispersive. You're experts already. So I'm going to have you link to this video. It basically is just an ophthalmologist preparing to do cataract surgery and squirting a little of each viscoelastic onto the surface of the cornea so you can see what it looks like. 
see what the cohesive looks like, and it'll look like a little ball um, up on top of the cornea, and the dispersive actually coats, and is actually a pretty good way of maintaining lubrication of the corneal surface during cataract surgery. All viscoelastic compounds are made of three basic substances, sodium hyaluronate, chondroitin sulfate, and hydroxymethylpropyl cellulose. Sodium hyaluronate is a bipolymer that's ubiquitous throughout the body. Chondroitin sulfate is found naturally in the cornea. HPMC is actually a plant material. It's cellulose in plant fibers, and it is not naturally found in human beings. So a little bit about sodium hyaluronate. It's found in the eye, in the aqueous and the vitreous. It's a long chain of bipolymers, and those long chains coil in solution. If you increase concentration, you obviously increase viscosity because of the intermolecular interactions. And the molecular weight of sodium hyaluronate molecules is between two and five million Daltons. Where do we get sodium hyaluronate to use in our viscoelastics? If you guessed rooster combs, you'd be correct. And fortunately, however, we also get it from bacterial fermentation. Let's move on to chondroitin sulfate. Like I said, it's naturally occurring in the cornea. It's a repeating disaccharide molecule or polymer, and its molecular weight is only 50,000 Daltons. So clearly, this is a lower molecular weight substance. This actually would be used in a dispersive agent because it's lower molecular weight. What's the source for chondroitin sulfate? If you guess shark fins, you'd be correct, but that's not, I guess, the usual source. And folks usually turn to cow trachea and pig ears and snouts. And yes, that really is true. All of these polymers come from naturally occurring substances and aren't man-made in a lab. On to HPMC. This is synthesized from purified cellulose, which like I said, is a structural substance in plant fibers and is a polymer of D-glucose molecules. So these molecules were actually used in OVDs several years ago, um, and actual vegetable fibers were found in some of the samples of OVDs that were used in the early 80s. Um, so these aren't commonly used any longer, um, just an interesting fact to make you look smart. And the source of that is actually cotton wool fibers and wood pulp. I should say the source of that was, because like I said, they're not really used very much in the United States anymore. So let's talk about sodium hyaluronate derived OVDs. Like I said, usually sodium hyaluronate is used to fashion viscocohesive OVDs. Helon was one of the first OVDs to be created, or actually was the first OVD to be created in the 1970s by Pharmacia. Helon GV was then fashioned because they wanted to make something that was greater viscosity. And so you can see what they did. They actually increased the concentration and increase the molecular weight. So both of those things led to an increase in viscosity. They came up with Helon 5 because they wanted something that had all the best properties of Helon GV and yet was retained in the anterior chamber throughout the entire procedure at low flow rates, making it a cohesive and then fractured and was easy, easily removed from the anterior chamber at high flow rates so that it became dispersive. So that was the first visco-adaptive viscoelastic. Helon Indicote's actually a newer viscoelastic and it's advertised as being a viscodispersive, which is interesting because sodium hyaluronate is used in its formulation. And like I said, usually the viscodispersive substances are created with uh, chondroitin sulfate. Amvisc was created in 1983 by Bosch and Lom and is a little bit less viscous than Helon. And that can make sense to you because look at its molecular weight, which is lower than Helon, but still it's viscocohesive. Amvisc Plus is a bit more cohesive and was sort of Bosch and Lom's answer to Helon GV. And Provisc was created by Alcon. They wanted to get into the game, and it is very similar to Helon. So all of these, again, pretty similar to one another with respect to Helon, Ambisc, and Provisc, and it's just um, your personal preference, which one you enjoy using. Let's move on to chondroitin sulfate and which viscoelastics are created with it. Viscote is a very common viscodispersive agent. Notice it's low molecular weight and a combination of sodium hyaluronate and chondroitin sulfate. 
So this is an excellent coder because it's a dispersive. Disco-Visc was Alcon's answer to Helon 5, and it has both um, cohesive and dispersive properties, so it is visco-adaptive. It's dispersive and cohesive, so it's visco-adaptive. Several of the companies that make viscoelastic use dual packs. Duovisc is one of those. It's viscoat and provisc together so that you don't have to open two separate packages for your viscocohesive and your viscodispersive agents. And Helon got into the game and made Helon Duet because now remember they have their own viscodispersive agent, so it's Helon and Helon Indicote. And then Helon Ultimate, which is just Helon and their viscoadaptive agent, Helon 5. HPMC, like I said, is really not used in the United States any longer, but to make you look smart, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ocucote and Cellugel. These were the viscodispersive and viscocohesive agents that were made with hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose. Bosch and Lom created Ocucote. Notice it's very low molecular weight, so it is a coder. It is dispersive. And then Cellugel was created by Alcon. Notice it's higher molecular weight, so that means it's a cohesive agent and neither of those are available in the United States any longer. So let's take a quiz. Can you tell me what type of OVD this is? Is it cohesive, dispersive, or viscoadaptive? If you said cohesive, you're correct. Now Helon GV, you are correct. That is cohesive. Let's move on. What about DiscoVisc? Correct, that's adaptive. That's got your cohesive properties and your dispersive properties depending on your flow rate. And dual visc, if you guess dual pack, you're right on because that's got your dispersive agent and your cohesive agent and you don't have to have your staff open two separate boxes. And now on to AMVIS, cohesive or dispersive. If you said cohesive, you're right on. Now Helon Duet, this is harder because it's a newer product. However, if you look right here, it gives you the answer. It's Helon and Helon Indicote. So it's a dual pack. If you said dual pack, you're right. Helon 5, which one is that one? Super viscous, it says. But remember, it is viscoadaptive. It does both. It's cohesive and dispersive, dependent on your flow rates. You're doing a great job. Now, let's talk about my favorite combo, what I use every week in the OR. Visco, cohesive or dispersive? If you said dispersive, you're right. And look right here. It's made with chondroitin sulfate. It also has a little sodium hyaluronate. And amvisc, cohesive or dispersive? Absolutely, cohesive. These are the two viscoelastics that I use to do the soft cell technique, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Okay, so let's continue with the quiz, but use video. So tell me what type of viscoelastic agent you believe this is that's being injected in the anterior chamber. If you said dispersive, you'd be correct. Notice how it goes in in like a squiggly chain-like and not big glob of stuff, as opposed to what type do you think this is? Notice how that goes in in one big glob? It's very cohesive. And like I said, usually a dispersive and cohesive agent are used to do the soft shell technique which means you use a cohesive agent injected after the dispersive agent to push the dispersive agent up next to your corneal endothelium because the main object of the use of the dispersive is to coat and protect. And then the main object of the cohesive is to flatten the capsule. We'll get to that later when it comes to creating a capsule rexus and make a space for you to work with all of your instruments inside the eye. And like I said, I use um, viscoat and amvisc to accomplish that. So let's just watch a little video of me doing the soft shell technique, which basically is the two videos you watched two seconds ago. Here goes my dispersive agent, my viscoat, and here comes my cohesive agent, pressing all of my dispersive agent up next to the endothelium and making a nice space for me to maneuver. What are some of the complications of viscoelastic devices? Well, there aren't many. Really, it's elevated intraocular pressure, and this occurs when the viscoelastic material isn't completely removed from the anterior chamber. It is transient, but it can be exquisitely painful because pressures can go very high, and the viscoelastic substance basically decreases the outflow of aqueous. It clogs up your drainage system. 
and sometimes for quite some time. If it's a dispersive agent, you know, those are shorter molecules and things usually um, exit in a shorter period of time. But if you've got a highly cohesive agent made up of a long chain polymer, it can take a long time for that to make its way out of the eye. So that's it for viscoelastics. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Let's go blue.